69. Fishing the DMV is on its way to its next major milestone of 200 Patreon supporters. We are only 69 Patreon supporters away on achieving this next major milestone and getting us ever more closer to starting a nonprofit. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon members will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Custom Rods. They'll be a part of the private Facebook group community that's growing at leaps and bounds every single week. Members only content like that big seminar we did last week on how to fish tidal rivers. And of course, weekly Patreon giveaways. For more information, click the link down below or check it up right above my head here. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and it's that wonderful time of year again in Northern Virginia when everyone comes out of their burrows and migrates to the tidal Potomac River. We have had about 38 tournaments in the past week, and it's been the first weekend that we didn't have a small craft advisory. I think Potomac teams have had two events canceled already. And so their very first one is going to be this coming weekend here, which will be the last weekend of April uh, since this is being pre-recorded. And I'm here with the MAKBF winner. And uh, Jake, what the hell is your title with MAKBF? President? Um, I'm in charge of, well, I'm part of the team that's in charge of sponsorship and uh, social media engagement. Pimp daddy, got it. So... <laughs> With, with 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 these two wonderful gentlemen here, we have the winner in here with with uh, Nate Hall. Um, but before we get to Nate, there was a really interesting conversation that I really want to have because I've been on a little bit of a streak here. I think I've had four consecutive, at least top twenties on the river, and people keep asking me like, "What the deal is with this?" And and you mentioned comfort. I think that's interesting because a lot of people that reach out to me are the ones that have never fished the Potomac, and they're very uncomfortable with how that place fishes. And me growing in Northern Virginia. You're just used to I-95 traffic, people being terrible, and the river's crowded. And you just got to deal with that crap. And so I really want to just have both of you kind of bounce off each other with the pre-practice stuff to begin with. But Jake, I'll, I'll start off with you. What were your thoughts going into this about where you were going to fish? Um, so I, I had limited time. I didn't have any time to pre-fish. I, I drove down on Friday. Um, and while driving down on Friday, I was notified my kid was in a crash and dealt with, you know, kind of that worry and, and thoughts on Friday. Um, so I really didn't get on the water on Friday. Um, and that basically led me to fish history. And I'll just be completely honest. There's three things that I know on the Potomac river. I know Mattawoman Creek. I know Aquia Creek and I know, um, the area down around Mallows Bay and that's it. I don't really know much else about the Potomac. I don't come down there a lot. Um, so <clears throat> I chose Aquia just based on history. Um, I know that, you know, it just like Madawoman, woman, there's big fish that live in Aquia. There's good grass in Aquia. There's Aquia has everything that you would possibly want to fish, whether it's wood, whether it's docks, whether it's grass, it doesn't matter. They have, they have rock, they have everything. So, um, I like the Aquia for that reason. I think there's a lot of fish that, you know, live their life in a quiet Creek until they take a boat ride over to Matta woman and see that it's the same. Um, so, or, you know, vice versa. So, um, you know, that was kind of my thought process going into it. Um, <clears throat> I know in previous years, it's been one in a quiet. I know last year it was one in a quiet. I know this year now it was one in a quiet. <laughs> well, I knew anyway, cause I saw him at the ramp anyway. Um, he was, I believe off in a distance, but I did see, uh, our man here, Nate, at the ramp at some point. So, <clears throat> but you chose not to. You chose, even though you're right. Like God knows how much money has been won out of Mad Woman and Aquia. It, there's a potential that that's where it's going to be 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 done. <clears throat> so but, I, I went there on day one, though. I did not go back on our second day tournament, um, based just based on what I saw in Aquia. And and honestly, what I'm about to tell you attests to what Nate even did in Aquia that day. But I mean, safely, Nate, how many boats did we have? 20, 30 kayaks? Yeah, probably. Right. So let's say let's say on the safe side, 25 kayaks. 
And then on top of that, there was like a 30, 40 boat John boat tournament that was, I, I believe, all electric only that went out of there that morning as well. I mean, there was a lot of traffic just going out of Aquia, not to mention the traffic coming to Aquia from the other places. Um, I did not feel comfortable. I mean, at one point, I'm not even lying to you. I caught a fish underneath of a dock. I skipped the chatterbait underneath of a dock, caught the fish. I'm measuring the fish. As I'm measuring the fish, one of the guys in the John boat skips his bait in front of my kayak from the other side of the dock. And I'm like, cool. I guess this is what we're doing. I'm not comfortable fishing like that. On on the Susquehanna or just up there or for River Smallmouth, what is that like? Because I just know when you're dealing with with tidal fisheries or grass, especially springtime where these, there's just a couple of spawning bays that they're really at, people get in on each other. Do people get t that tight and conglomerate on the Susky or is so it a lot what, more spacing? What's nice about here is we don't have tournaments in April, May or the beginning part of June um, because they shut it down for the spawn. So you're not allowed to have a tournament in Pennsylvania during that time frame. Um, there are still guys that go out and target smallmouth. And I'll tell you that, you know, just like you were talking with Chris Gorsuch last night, the creeks get loaded, the creeks get creeks get packed. There are community holes um, that, you know, and when I say community holes, I'm talking about community bedding areas, really. Um, but there's so much river miles here to to go and traverse. And there's so many creeks of creek miles that you can go and traverse. It is not like the Potomac. And what I the reason I say that is because almost everywhere on the Susquehanna and, and, and even the associated creeks, it's rock bottom right? Not everywhere on the Potomac is rock bottom. You don't have hard bottom everywhere, right? The areas where you don't have hard bottom, you have grass and that grass starts coming up in April as those fish are starting to spawn. And in the Potomac where there's grass, there's 50 boats or maybe a hundred boats. What is the proper etiquette? Cause I think this there was a video on this that you did, but it was like you and another kayak angler were, were sharing a creek. It was either a Hobie event or a bass event. I think it was Christine Fisher one day. Yeah. In general, like for the river, what is what is a good etiquette for for that place? Is it like two hundred feet of spacing, uh, like fifty? Like I mean, what what is comfortable? I don't I don't I don't really know. I mean, it's it's a it's a judgment call because you could be fishing a current seam and in and in, in, you know, Nate could be fishing a current seam and you guys might be 50, you know, 50 yards apart, but you're fishing two different parts of the river. Whereas in the Potomac, you know, you're fishing a grass flat that's coming up and you guys are like crisscrossing each other. That, that doesn't really happen on the Susquehanna. What, what Christine and I did was very unique. Um, and honestly, it was a gamble. It was a big gamble because both of us, I, you know, Arguably, I mean, I'm pretty decent on the Susquehanna. Dividing Christine, fish. You know, Chris is, is pretty decent. Uh, Christine is pretty decent on the Susquehanna. So, you know, putting two quality anglers in the same starting spot was dangerous for us. Um, the fortunate part was is that that, for, that starting spot sucked. <laughs> so, like, I caught a fish. She caught a dink. And I think she was just like, man, this isn't going to work out. And I wasn't leaving. I didn't plan on leaving all day long because I knew that the stretch of that river that I was in, it could be one at. Um, and just to that note, Christine, Russ Fisher, or uh, yeah, Christine Fisher, Russ Snyder, and myself all fished that same stretch of river. And we were all in the top 10. Christine, I think, was ninth. I was fourth. And Russ was second. So, you know, the stretch of river that we were in, I knew that the right fish were there. So I wasn't leaving. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to leave And the hole that we started on. I knew would reload. And it was just a matter of me waiting for her to, you know, get annoyed that I was still there and leave. So that's what I did. Interesting. Yeah. I, I always find, find these conversations fascinating. I know, I think, uh, well, this is the plan is Chris Gorsuch and we're trying to get uh, Jeff little to do a, a, an etiquette thing, kayak versus jet boat. Cause I, I, I am very fascinated by, 
everyone has it's like baseball it's like these stupid unwritten rules and they really do need to be like verbalized and written down for the next generation to be like this is kind so of the set of stuff i can give you i can give you one unwritten rule right now that most people would not believe um well it's a couple one if you're a kayaker and you're fishing in an area where you can like pedal or or even motor up through that's probably the only spot that that jet boat can get up through wherever you're at so don't be lollygagging hanging out in those spots because if you see a jet boat coming get out of the way that's like if you're if you're in the current and there's water there that's giving you the ability to pedal or paddle or, or even motor up it that's likely the only spot that jet boat can get up through that chute so get the hell out of their way um because a lot of times if they come off plane they're ripping they're ripping shit off their boat so you know that's one unwritten rule that most people don't understand um the other unwritten rule i'll be completely honest with you i forgot just now so <laughs> <laughs> we we will we will clip edit that in later um the, the, the one thing i never got to ask you about and this is a great segue for for your for your corporate hat here the first event was canceled what went into it that was. decision and then honestly this two day or was the beginning of your season correct yeah so we had an event planned on the Juniata River in April 6th, and we received an unimaginable amount of rain starting like Sunday, and it wasn't going to stop until Thursday. Um, I had been watching the river levels. I'd been watching the projections, and a lot of times those projections are off a couple feet. So, you know, Sunday, Monday, I had high hopes. I'm like, oh, man, like if we just don't get this amount of rain, we're going to be okay. Monday, we got a lot of rain. I was like, all right, I got to take a drive. And I drove Tuesday the entire boundary, like the entire length of the river. I drove from mm -hmm. the mouth all the way up to McVeigh Town and back down. And I was checking creeks and I was looking at surrounding areas and I was looking at the river gauges. And I just knew when I saw the amount of standing water just in fields and stuff along the river, I was like, hmm this bad boy ain't going to drain out. Like we're, we're like, we get another inch of rain and we're done. And then, you know, Wednesday and Thursday, I think we got like three more inches of rain. Um, so it was, it was historic. I want to say, I'll say historical flooding, but I mean, they made it, you know, really high. I think it was like 20 plus feet and the Juniata typically runs, you know, three and a half, four. So, Damn. you know, you're looking at a significant amount of water. We had to cancel that event, but we rescheduled it. June 22nd, Yay. maybe okay. June 22nd. We're going back to the Juniata. Um, it's not going to be the pre-spawn, you know, bronze insanity that we wanted to have. It's not going to be the, you know, 100 inches, but it'll still produce mid 90s pretty easily. Um you know, just that springtime, that beginning of April, it can really just be stupid. You can go up there and catch five 20 inch fish and be like, what am I only two hours into the day? Like what? It is interesting because you can go there in the Susky a bunch of different times a year and it can still be pretty good. Why mm -hmm. generally, and it's not just your club. Does everyone feel like they pick the title Potomac in April and May? I mean, I so I think in this area, because Pennsylvania does have that closure of the bass spawn, the best time to get on places like the tidal Potomac and the upper Bay then become that early spring time frame. And a lot of that's dictated by Pennsylvania, you know, Pennsylvania closes, you know, basically two months out of the tournament year is closed to bass fishing tournaments in Pennsylvania. So those first two months, you have to have events somewhere. And that's where, you know, a lot of times the tidal Potomac and the upper Chesapeake Bay come into play because it would be really fun to go fish in July and, you know, going out there frogging and punching mats and doing that kind of stuff. Like I'm 100% all for it. And maybe, you know, maybe we can make it happen, but <clears throat> you know, July and August is really during the tournament timeframe. That's when we can have tournaments on the Susquehanna and places like that. Um, you run the risk like we did this year, trying to have a tournament before the closure. And, you know, you run that risk of now you get into, okay, well, we have to cancel because high water or, you know, 
it's unsafe because of cold weather, you know, like you run into those risks and that's one of the things we try to avoid in that early season is putting our anglers on unsafe water. So why port tobacco? Because you could probably have gone to the moon and it'd be closer for like me. That is, it was such an interesting spot to put it. It was there like, did you have a corporate deal or something like that? Like what, All right. what went into so, the decision? Um, Charles County department of um, rec and, and parks and all that, um, they're in a process of a rebranding. They're Explore Charles County. It's the Visitors Bureau for Charles County. Um, they presented this event for us. Um, now, we could have tried and put it in the Plata or Waldorf, some more, more built, you know, built up, but that would have just been further away from the guys who were fishing on the Virginia side, and we did not want to alienate them or make them have to get off the water, um, you know, an hour or so early just to make it the check-in. Um, so we tried to choose the best parking and, you know, best area that we could for the anglers that would be coming from the Virginia side to our check-in. Um, and that's why we chose the Port Tobacco Marina there. How did you get hooked up with that county? That's so interesting. You know, we're Thomas, we're not going to talk about the <sighs> methods in which we, you know, obtain our funding for our series. <laughs> um, just, just know that between me and Josh Evans and Trey Leach, we have a, um, we have a good working relationship with a lot of our sponsors. So we, uh, we were able to get Charles County on board with us this year. And really, I mean, they, they made our event what it is like that because they sponsored our event, it didn't matter how many entry entry fees we had, like how much money we had from entry fees each day started out with a $500 prize pot because of them. Um, and they, you know, they were huge in that, in that, in doing that, you know, what our, our goal was to, you know, promote their, their area. And, you know, Charles County is awesome. I used to live there. Really? Like I used to live. Yeah. I used to live in Brian's road, right up the road from Marshall hall landing. You went from there to chasing smallmouth in the Susky. That's I was in damn. the military though. I was stationed oh. in Andrews and I, and I lived down in, in Charles County. Um, I tried to get out of PG County for obvious reasons. Um, you know, I don't like getting robbed in the daylight. So, um, you know, <laughs> and a legend was born. Um, <laughs> poor tobacco is interesting is back in high school. I'm dating myself a little bit. I used to catch bass down there in Port tobacco way back. I when heard that the, that the salt content has infiltrated in there, which, which has killed the grass, which has made it very difficult for bass fishing. The striper, though, are there. Flounder, um, mm -hmm. blue cats, of course. You can catch a ton of them. Will, it, right. will this be the hardest event all year for you scheduling a base of operations at the end of the tournament? Because it's such a massive area to try to yes. get people to congregate. Yes, without a doubt. Um, you know, the Potomac River presents a huge challenge when it comes to finding a spot where you can have a check-in awards to give back to a sponsor who has, you know, promoted your series and given you money um, because we're not boats, you know, we don't, yeah. we don't have the ability to run across the river, you know, 70 miles an hour to get back to the same launch. Um, so, you know, it, it is a huge undertaking to try to find somewhere and dude, we pulled, like I pulled all of my hair out. <laughs> Every single last strand of hair came out between me and Josh Evans. Um, you know, trying to find that location that would be that that money location for our anglers to make sure that we weren't putting them out. Um, it was difficult for sure, but it would it will absolutely be the hardest without a doubt for us all year long to have to find a location. We already have locations found for our next few events. So how did you feel about the event as a whole now that you can like you it's in the books, it's done. Were you happy with the turnout? Were you happy how everything went and were the sponsors happy? I mean, I, I, so I think the sponsors are happy. We, we, have um, one thing we're doing right now is we've created a survey for the anglers to complete. Um, they'll receive a link to the survey, um, through a Torney X push notification, and then they'll be able to, that link will take them to our website where they can do the survey. Um, and we're going to be able to provide some metrics back to Charles County to show them, excuse me, to show them what their money has, has gotten them. Um, we were extremely happy with the turnout. 61 is a good number. Um, you know, we were in the 60s when when Bassmaster came to the Susquehanna 
as a local club. So for us to not have a national series present and still get 60, we're very happy with the turnout. Um, I wish the turnout on day two could have been a little higher, but I also understand that we're going to lose out on people who can't fish both days. Um, so, you know, it, it was, we're, we're overall very pleased as a group with, with the amount of anglers. And, you know, and a lot of that has to be, it has to be said about being able to partner with like NVKBA and, and CRM, um, being able to have three clubs on the same body of water. So we're not all scheduling on top of each other because this market is so incredibly oversaturated, right? Kayak fishing is, is the most popular way to fish anymore because it's because of the money that it takes to get in with that. There's, you know, so many clubs that are popping up everywhere. Well, there's only so many weekends in a tournament season. So when we had the leadership groups that were able to talk to each other, that we were able to have good communication and, and, you know, conversations about where and boundaries and, and rules and so on and so forth, having that good, good lines of communication between the leadership groups really honestly made this event what it was, you know, I mean, having just, that was huge. Because when you can put three clubs on the same body of water on the same days, all the clubs benefit from that. So it's also a great financial opportunity for anglers because unlike a catch and you know haul them across the lake tournament, you can in theory enter all three, and in theory you could win all three. Um, right. You can't do that with bass boat tournaments. You just can't. Right. And you know I, I know Nate. Nate got to cash in on that with at least I don't know. Did you did you enter NVKBA or no? I did not. No. Um, so I know Nate won both days for N uh, MAKBF and CRM. Like, I'm not going to talk about what the man's got in his pocket right now, mm. but his pocket's full, like both. <laughs> he can reach in double fist and pull out <laughs> thousands. Like. And with my, the, the BF, the BFL group I'm with, that's the one thing we always talk about is it's just so blindingly expensive now on the boat side and the best bang for your buck return on your investment is the kayaking thing where it's like 40 to $60 entry fee randomly. And you can still win a thousand bucks. It's a hell of a lot better than the BFLs right now. Much yeah. better. I mean, I'll put it to you this way because of our sponsorship this year, if we get 35 people for every event that we have, no matter what, if we get those 35 people signed up, every event will pay out a thousand dollars. Imagine paying a $50 entry fee, going to fish against 35 people in first place takes a thousand. And we still pay out two more spots after that. Like those are good, good numbers. There's not many local clubs that are doing that. So and you have a bunch of other sponsors, right? Yeah. Can I talk about them? Mm -hmm. I mean, I had an, all these papers. I, I teed yeah. it up. I know you did some spelling checks and stuff and you wrote it in your favorite crayon. So go for it. I want to talk about the sponsors so we can get Nate to talk about how he beat the life out of all of us on both days. Um, so I'm going to start off by saying MAKBF is, um, you know, we're extremely happy and excited for, for 2024. Um, you know, we were, what we were able to do at the Potomac is only just the beginning uh, between working with the other clubs and and we even have a couple national trails that are coming um, bass masters coming to the susquehanna and as is native with their big bass power hour um, we're really excited about what we're going to present this year um, a lot of that is because of sponsorships uh, first and foremost you know the anglers are always going to be number one right in our heart they're the, they're the first sponsors because they're putting their money into the series um, but without them you know, MAKBF, you know, we don't exist, but our series sponsor is Delaware Paddle Sports and Delaware Paddle Sports has been with us for a number of years now. Um, what, you know, they're, everybody knows Delaware Paddle Sports. They're the largest, you know, paddle sports retailer, probably on the Eastern side of the country. They deliver uh, tax free. Whenever you go down there and buy a boat, you're not paying a couple hundred dollars worth of taxes because they don't have sales tax. Um, you know, you can buy every major a major brand of kayak at DPS. So, you know, having them as a series sponsor is is huge for us. And they've been with us for a number of years and we're really happy to have them. They also rig in their shop too. So you can buy a boat and get it rigged there. Um, did I say they deliver? I don't know if I said they deliver, but they do also deliver. 
Um, you know, the Potomac, the Potomac event was had an individual individual presenting sponsor, and that was the Charles County Department of Recs. Um, you know, they're in a process of rebranding. They can be found anywhere on online and on social media as Explore Charles County. But they were our presenting sponsor for the, you know, for the Potomac events. Um, you know, Charles County is rich in history. I would encourage anybody if they're going to the Potomac, you know, La Plata, Waldorf, those those communities around, you know, that area. There's so many hotels and stuff for, you know, to offer for people. If you want to go down and fish for a weekend, um, I would absolutely stay in Charles County because then you're also avoiding the Virginia traffic. Um, but they graciously supported us and they made the event a huge success. And during the event, we also had some really awesome product sponsor giveaways. Um, BioNO Power. I mean, I'm going to talk more about them here in a minute, but BioNO Power came on huge. We gave away a free 100 amp hour, 12 volt battery, lithium battery with a charger to one of our members. And all you had to do was sign up for both days and be a member. That was it. Um, that person walked away with a you know, free 12 volt, 100 amp hour battery. Boondocks gave us one of their groovy consoles and riser kits, you know, for people to put their graphs and stuff on the front of their kayaks. We gave one of those away. Um, BioNO has donated a lot more, which I'll talk about here in just a few minutes. But um, as it has, has bon Boondocks as well, they've also um, given a lot more too. But some of our other sponsors, Newport Vessels, they're our Tournament of Champions and Angler, the year sponsor. Our AOI is going to win a motor. Um, and with that, BioNO has donated a 24 volt battery to go be paired with that motor. So you have a full system that you don't have to pay for. Angler of the Year will be walking away with a huge prize package. Um, also, one of our members, David Burt, he is a, a kayak fishing guide in the Atlantic region. He has donated a tarpon trip, a tarpon trip to the Angler of the Year as well. So that's really cool. Um, BioNO, they've also given us another 12 volt, 100 amp hour battery that we'll be giving away at the Upper Chesapeake Bay. Um, that presenting sponsor for that event is Visit Harford. Uh, they're Harford County, Maryland, and they're going to be presenting our Conowingo on May 4th. And Tactical Fishing Co Company, which is the bait company we have, is presenting our Upper Bay event. They have tag teamed on that event to make our payouts what they're going to be. Um, in addition, and um, you know, Tactical has done that in addition to also giving us bags of baits to hand out at every event. Um, and, you know, I know Nate got two of them, two little goodie boxes for our winners. Um, you know, there's some, you know, there's some good stuff in there and tact, you know, tactical fishing company has donated a lot of stuff for us this season. So we're really excited to have him on board. Um, the Juniata river Valley was supposed to have already sponsored our Juniata river event, but as we talked about, it got rescheduled to June 22nd. So the Juniata River Valley Visitors Bureau is our presenting sponsor for there. And we'll also have Suspens, who has given us some product to give away at that event. Uh, July, Innovative Sportsman will be our presenting sponsor for both days of the Susquehanna River uh, Tournament with Bassmaster. That's going to be July 27th and 28th. And Ego Fishing, uh, they have donated some, some cool giveaways for that event. Native Kayaks is going to be the presenting sponsor that for the event ran simultaneous with the Big Bass Power Hour. That's going to be mid-October. All of those events get those big checks to take home. Anybody, anybody that fishes with us in one of our in one of our events this year, first, second, and third, and Big Bass, anyone that wins any of those um, will walk away with two, you know, with big checks. I know Nate got two big checks this weekend that he got to take home and hang on his wall. I don't, I don't see him up there yet, but I won't, I'll, I'll go home. <laughs> I won't give him a hard time because they're not, you know, we're still fresh. Um, but because of the, because of those checks going, getting handed out, those were all purchased and bought by a company called nature's best wildlife artistry. They're a local taxidermist in Mount Airy, Maryland. He does great work for fish and deer. If you're a hunter or anything like that, um, in addition to those sponsors, we have a bunch of product donations. Uh, the product donations are through the roof. Boondocks has given us uh, a T-bone bed extender and a landing gear kit on top of what we already gave away. Temple Fork Outfitters has donated some rod gift certificates for our runner-up Angler of the Year prizes. Bates Fishing Company on top of the membership drive hundo that they already gave us to give out. They've given us 
two real gift certificates to, to get paired up with runner up AOI prizes. Yak Power will have some product giveaways um, that will get coupled with yet more bio NO batteries. So many bio NO batteries coming out of here this year. Those will be done at the TOC. Fishing Online, Kayak Cushion, Jake's Bait and Tackle, they've all donated um, gift certificates in some fashion for us to give away. Old Line Baits is our online series sponsor because we have an online series to help new people get into the sport in a non-pressured, non, um, you know, just a, an easy way for them to learn how to get out and fish with us and measure fish and the process of term, you know, the tournament with culling and everything else like that. The online series is kind of dedicated to that to help those people get into it with us. And the leading person from the angler of the year race for the online series only will get an invite to the TOC to fish for, for that money as well. Um, in addition to that, I, I mentioned tactical fishing company, Mex custom baits. He paints crank baits, never lost gear. Those will be handed out at every event this year. And last but not least, and I'll stop talking after this, um, our, our website has all of our sponsors on it with their sponsor links. And then there's also a tab on our website that has discount codes. That's typically all of our members know about it, but now everybody that's listening to Fishing the DMV knows about it, and we encourage you to go use those discount codes. Go visit our sponsors' websites. Use that discount code. It helps us retain those sponsors for years to come. So with that, let's celebrate Nate. Nate, let's do that. Nate, if you're still there, if you're still awake, yeah. <laughs> um, welcome to the show. Is this your first year fishing with the in, in, with the kayak group? Uh, with, well, with this MK kayak MK. group, with MAKBF, this is my first season uh, fishing more, multiple of their events. I think I fished one that they did a paired up event with one of either Hobie or Bass in the years past, and I did fish that one. But overall, this is my first time fishing like a full season with them. Why? Uh, so I'm actually from the western side of Pennsylvania. I'm about an hour north of Pittsburgh. So they are on the other side of the state. And it's about a five-hour drive, give or take, except for the Susky. That's the closest one to me, which is about three and a half hours. So they're a bit of a distance away from me. What is the fishing culture like over there? Because I'm thinking Ohio River, you know, six pounds wins it. Uh, so uh, we actually fish a lot of lakes. So a lot of the lakes in Western PA are horsepower limited. So a lot of them are either 20 or 25 horsepower limited, which is great for us kayaks. So we can get out there and have tournaments out there. Um, but it typically takes 90 plus inches to win most of our tournaments on the, the lakes out here. But the reason why you don't hear about them is because of the horsepower limit. They can't have the BFLs. They can't have the big boat tournaments on them because they can't run their boats. That's what's that's yeah. Ugh. I don't know if Nate knows this, but I grew up south of Pittsburgh by about thirty miles, and I can attest to the fact that every single trout stocked lake in Western Pennsylvania has giant, absolute giant bass in it. Yeah, just take a, take a huddle, take a huddle, and go to work. It's crazy because there are so many lakes like that. I mean, I, I've been singing the praises of, of the res since I saw it, that it took 32 pounds to win the first tournament. And then la on Sunday, this past Sunday, it took 28 and a guy brought in a nine, a seven and a six. Uh, okay. it, it, and you've never heard of this place before. And it's so interesting that there's so many of those little places that are like Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland, that you can go and you can get fat in a hurry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Growing up there, though, with those lakes, are you dealing with more of a clear water environment? Like, what is the culture that you kind of brought when you started to fish tournaments? Is it that it dink is, and dunking type of vibe? They are all shallow grass fisheries. So it's huh. all grass, punching, <laughs> flipping, frogging all summer long. That's about all That's about all I do. Um, you, there are some offshore stuff on some of the lakes. Um, the, um, the PFBC here in Pennsylvania puts a lot of structure offshore. But that's mostly for the crappy and perch guys. Um, but you can't catch bass off of them, but most of them shallow grass pads, frogging and flipping. I've always wanted to know if the state has a deal with the Christmas tree like people, because my <laughs> God, the amount of trees and shit they put in lakes doesn't make any sense. That's a whole other well, conversation. I don't think the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission are the ones sinking trees. I think no. that's your that's your Joe Schmoes that are, you know, have a boat that wants yep. to get rid of the Christmas tree. Um, but you know, Growing up where I grew up is, you know, very close to where he grew up. I can attest to it. There is no reason why I should suck on the Potomac River. I typically do <laughs> suck on the Potomac River. Like I can't and I, it has to be a comfort level. It has to be a mental thing for me. 
but almost all of our lakes are very shallow. I'll tell you, I'll tell you about one that I grew up with, Virgin Run Lake. I'm sure you know you've probably heard of it, Nate. I actually um, haven't. No, it's so Virgin yeah. Run Lake. It don't tell Russell Johnson that I told him about it. <laughs> all right, <laughs> um, but Virgin Run is a it's a trout stock water, and and it's very similar. It's 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 a you know not a lot of hard bottom. It's a lot of clay, and hmm. it's got a lot of grass, and it's got a lot of trout. And those bass thrive. That's so cool. There. Like I, I never would have had that on my bingo card that that's what Pennsylvania fishing is like. Um, yeah. Damn. So what was your experience on tide? Cause it sounds like, okay, so you do have the background with grass. Yeah. What about tide and the boat? Zero. Traffic? Zero. Okay. I've actually never been this. This weekend was my first time ever at the Potomac. Holy shit. I had never fished the Potomac before. Never even seen the river until I showed up Friday morning to pre-fish. So, so I bet he'll be back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you pick a quiet then? I, I, is like out of all the places, cause it's a big freaking place to break down. Yeah. So when I was looking into it, when I decided I was going to fish it on um, the two creeks that kept coming up and everything, every YouTube video, every podcast or anything like that were mad woman and a quiet. And so I decided Friday, I went and I pre-fished mad woman and I just couldn't figure it out where I was. I don't know what they were doing or what I was doing incorrectly, but I was catching fish. I just was not catching the quality that I was looking for. And so rather than trying to go back there, we're in an area I didn't have confidence in. I said, I'm just going to try somewhere new and just go fishing. And if it happens, it happens. If not, then not, but I wasn't going to go fish somewhere. I wasn't confident. A quiet Creek is a very interesting place. You have the Creek proper and then you have the, the place that's coated by the locals of the beach, which is really just, it's just the mouth of the stupid place. It's a really good spawning area. Um, very, very good sometimes of the year, but it's also very susceptible to weather conditions and stuff. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't have a motor and you're kayaking, be very careful because that's a, that's a gnarly place to get out to. How did you break down a quia? Did you go t- towards the mouth one in practice? Did you like, how are you going to break that down? Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't practice there. I showed up the tournament morning, the tournament. Um, and I basically Badass. just said, <laughs> like Jake said, there are a ton of boats there and stuff. So I kind of laid back and let, let all the kayaks launch on um, the John boats launched after us, but I let all the kayaks launch, watch where they went. And I just kind of went, and honestly, I went straight across from where we launched to the bank that was right there. Um, and that's where I started my day, but I was just kind of like, I'm going to just stay away from everybody else, at least to start and see if I can kind of figure out my own thing. Why just across? Or is it just like, you're just going to eat it? It was, it was just close. I, and I, I paddle. <laughs> I don't have a motor. I don't have pedals or anything like that. I straight up paddle my kayak and it was close. And I don't like, I don't have any experience fishing docks. So a lot of the lakes over here in Western Bay are also state parks. So they don't have houses on them. There's no docks. Oh, for you to fish. There's, there's like one dock on every lake in West. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not used to fishing docks or whatnot. And where we launched, it was all like marinas and docks and stuff. So I'm not real comfortable fishing that. And so I decided I'm going to go over. I could see that there were lay downs over on the other bank. I was just going to go there and start there. And could just I, my plan was just to work around and just fish and until I started getting fish. If you had a motor, would you have still made those decisions? Yeah. I always mainly just because, and that's mainly just because I didn't know the area. Like there wasn't a spot where I'm like, oh, I need to go here or oh, I want to get here because I didn't know. And so I probably would have done the same thing. If now, if I knew of a spot or thought that I knew of a spot, then I may have done something different and tried to make a run out to it. But just because I didn't know any better, I just stayed close. Nolan Miner I had on the show about two years ago before I got into kayak fishing. He said something very poignant. He fished the opens as a boater, fished in college, and then he made the switch over to kayak. And he said like, when you put scope on a kayak, you realize you don't know how many fish you're fishing over because when you have a 250, there's something in your brain that tells you you got to move. You have to move. You, you, you can't just sit and fish. And that really stuck with me that when you have just a kayak and it's pedal or paddle, and I've talked to some guys that, that were in your situation in the wind, they pick an area and they don't have a choice. This is where I'm going to stay and figure it out. And I always think that's fascinating. The more crap we add, does that sometimes clutter our judgment of like, well, I can just zip over here, zip over there versus you're on the shit. You're on the winning stuff. You just have to adjust a few things uh, for what you're doing. Well, I can tell you from my experience, having all the extra stuff does change that and does cause you to make mistakes. Because I had a motor on my kayak for about two years, 2021 and 2022, I used a motor. Hmm. And I ended up getting rid of it because I found myself doing that. I was running around too much. I was trying to make two or three mile runs in the middle of the day. that would take me an hour to do. And then, you know, then it wouldn't work out. And I'd have to do the same thing going all the way back to where I was previously. 
And so I said, I'm done doing that. I'm just going to paddle and just stick to an area. Sounds like my day two on the Potomac. (laughs) 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 So then your first, like your first fish, like when did you get on the board to begin with on on Saturday? I caught my first fish in the first 10 minutes. It was only 12 inches, but I did catch one in the first about 10 minutes. Was that a fluke or was that actually getting you dialed in? Uh, It started the process of me getting dialed in. Um, Basically the way I look at it is it told me that there were fish there. Like there were fish that you could catch in that area. Um, and so it told me it kind of kept me to stay there a little bit longer. Had I not caught that fish, if I didn't catch a fish in 15, 20 minutes, I may have not necessarily moved super far, but it's kind of fish through the area a lot quicker than having caught that one early and being like, okay, there are fish here. How can I catch the rest of them? What happened next? So the next I kept doing what I was doing, which just a little chatterbait on the inside grass line there. Um, and actually what turned me on to the bite mainly was I had two fish come up and hit the chatterbait right next to the boat. Um, and what I noticed was they weren't coming at it horizontally with the bait as it came across. They were coming vertically straight up. And so I knew that they were stationed out a little bit from the bank. They weren't on the wood. They weren't on the bank. They were sitting out on the grass line. And so once I figured that out, then it was easy peasy, parallel the grass line. And I filled my limit in the first hour. Angles are so important. And this is the one thing I... I I don't know why people don't really appreciate how important that is. And I go from like a boating culture where you have a co-angler and you, you don't put the boat or the kayak right on the bank and fish down that same depth to where you can maximize your results. Everyone wants to stay away from the bank and go from shallow to deep, shallow to deep. And sometimes that works, but a lot of times just simply paralleling and so that you're getting the most bang for your buck on the cast, that's all it takes to have success. Yeah, for sure. Jake, what was going on with you this day? At this time frame, uh, day one, I, I, I actually was not very far from Nate. I don't know if he knows that or not, but I literally went under the train bridge and I started fishing the grass mat right there past the, the, tr- the train bridge. Um, I wanted to try to fish that early in the morning when we had the high tide and, and rip a chatterbait through it and just, you know, kind of fish through it. Uh, fortunately enough, you know, I had the torpedo with the grass cutter on it from innovative sportsman and going through that stuff, even the, you know, the grass cutter was just chopping it all off. So I was able to just get right through it. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't catching and probably because I wasn't on the edge of the grass line, I probably needed to be on the edge of the grass line. I was trying to fish the middle of the grass. And then I started, I went to the inside edge of the grass line thinking to myself, okay, if they're not in the grass and I had, I didn't exactly know where the grass line started there because I was already inside of it. So I went to the inner, there's a little channel that was in there that I went inside and and started fishing that and I didn't get bit. So I was like, all right, not wasting any more time. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to make a run. And I made a run in, in, in route to where I had done okay last year, but I had, <clears throat> I had seen some stuff as I was making a run, I, I saw some stuff like popping inside, inside of a couple docks. And I was like, Oh, time out. Hold on. I'm gonna go over and see what's going on over there. And, and that was where I caught my first fish, which was an 18 off of a, off of a dock on the inside edge of, of the grass that was there. And then I went to the dock next to it and I caught like a 14 and I was like, okay, well, I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. And then I did that basically the rest of the day until i went and found some spawning fish that i could not catch um i believe they were just some males that were up on beds and every time i pitched to it the male would leave the bed there wasn't two fish but you could tell that there was a bed there so and it was super super clear on that side of aquaia that i was on so i could see the beds over there i think the fish that were on the docks were also on dead on beds um i just couldn't see them because the water was dirtier Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I caught all of my limit off of docks on day one in, in the quiet, in the inside edge of the docks, not the outside. I wasn't catching anything on the outsides. It was, it was, you know, up close to the shoreline. Um, I went across the, across the Creek, I guess on the North side of the Creek and, you know, that giant grass flat that's in that big cove over there, getting closer to the mouth. I, powered through all that with my torpedo and got back into 
the areas where there wasn't much grass. And, and when I got in there, I, I mean, it was like bed central. There were beds everywhere. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I pulled out some soft plastics and started pitching to it. And every time I would pitch on the bed, the fish would just leave. And I'm like, mm, they're not actively spawning because he wasn't even trying to pick it up to move it. Like he yeah. was, he would just leave. So I feel like we're about in the comments section when this thing gets uploaded, we'll, we'll kill me on this one way or the other, but I feel like we're about two weeks away. I think when the BFL gets here, the first one, it might be full. Sp it's just a weird freaking year. It really is. <laughs> I would disagree. I, I would think too. So? I, 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 so my afternoons were spawning fish and my fish were locked on. And they, oh, they were. As soon as it, as soon as anything floated near their bed, they were all over it. Yep, the one yeah. I found an area that no one else was fishing, and it was just me. But they were locked on as tight as could be. They didn't. They bucks move. and females. Yeah, more bucks and females. But there were. I caught uh, my biggest fish day one was a female up on a bed. Yeah, that I actually my, broke yeah. off first before I caught it, and she didn't move. I, mean, I broke off, and she sat there, did not move one inch away from the bed. Wow. That first 18 that I caught in the morning, um, that fish had a an, like a freshly bloody tail as well. Um, that's what kind of made me stay on the inside edge of that grass line because I'm like, that tail is fresh blood. Like it was fresh. So she was down there, you know, doing her thing, getting sealed off the bed or whatever. Like I was like, okay, yeah. And now I, I'm pretty sure that there were spawning fish inside both grass edges on both sides of the creek. I just could see them on one and couldn't see them on the other. That's what's so interesting about this fishery is the length. Because if you go up to DC, they're probably full pre spawn. But when you travel the 50 oh, miles yes. down river, uh, well, it's fascinating. I'll speak to that day two when I <laughs> launched at Marshall Hall Landing. Um, the water temperature was about eight degrees cooler than it was down in Aquia. Because was I in, think we was had in 65, I think like 60, 64, 65. I don't know. I didn't Ooh. have a fish finder. <laughs> <laughs> it was 59 up at a Pohick. Yeah, it was, it was pretty 59. warm. It was in the sixties in Aquia. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, later in the day, like he said, you know, once that sun came out and the cloud cover wore off and you could see, like later in the day, you could see the beds like they were mm. up on the beds, at least the ones that I could see were all males, but they were on the beds. And that, you know, another thing to be said to that, too, is I don't know if I don't know if boaters had came in there and took females off the beds either earlier in the day. That could have very well happened, too. So, yeah, and I think the strategy here is, too, that you, you had Mr. Bass for the Maryland Federation and the Pennsylvania, I think. Pennsylvania was Thursday, Friday, and Maryland was Saturday, Sunday, going out of Smallwood. So that place was already getting pounded. There was a lot of retreads at Smallwood, though. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Like, and that's the problem with Matter Woman is, yeah, you know, I've always said this about title in general. And now I, and, and, you know, I want to get back to you about this, but title is the easiest place to cash the check, but it's the hardest place to win. You know, if you had to place, you just stay in Matta Woman in the summer and you will figure out a way to catch 15 pounds because it just gets reloaded every freaking day with fish. Yeah. And there's a there's a Thursday night jackpot that goes out of the back of Aquia, and that usually has like 50 to 100 boats. That place gets refueled every you know Thursday night. Um, like, there's a reason these places are just hot, you know. Nate, getting back to you, you're fishing the grass line with the chatterbait, and it is now up at Pohick uh, and Belmont, I guess it would be kind of like the same area. We had a real high tide at the morning going, and it's pulling out as the day went on. What was the tide swing there that you were it dealing was, with? It was, well, I don't have any experience on the Potomac, so I don't really know for sure, but I do know that it was much more exaggerated than it was on Sunday. Like, there's definitely a big difference between what happened Saturday and what happened Sunday with the tide. Um, but yeah. my bite actually died on that inside grass line when the tide started going out. It seemed like it was a high tide bite. They moved up, yeah. and then once that tide started dropping, I think they actually pushed back out into the grass, and that bite kind of died off because it only lasts about an hour and a half in the morning. By about seven thirty or so, it shut off completely, and I had to figure out something else. How did you figure out that something else, like and 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 not spin your wheels out? Did you just have enough inches at that point where you felt calm? 
I, yeah, I mean, catching a limit after having a rougher pre-fishing day on Friday definitely helped calm me down. But I also had gone in with the mindset, of, I'm just going to fish around. Like, I'm literally just going to go around, just cover some water and just fish. And so that kind of helped, too, because I just basically I went up the bank. I went back one time in that first hour or so, stopped getting bit. And I was like, well, I'm just going to keep going down the bank past where I went last time. And that's why I just kept working my way around. And it just kept, it kept me calm just knowing that I'm just going to keep moving. And I'm going to keep fishing stuff that looks like fish should be on it. And there, I consistently caught fish throughout the day, which also helped. Did you make any kind of switches or are you just going to lock the chatterbait in? Or is I, it because? I stopped on the chatterbait as soon as that morning bite died um, and switched over to just a Texas Rick Sanko. That's um, impressive because I don't think I would have the discipline to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's, I think most of that was because of my experience fishing these grass lakes up in Western PA. Um, a lot of our lakes, they're hot in the morning. The bass will come up, they'll hit moving baits, they'll do all that. And then once that sun usually starts to come up here in Western PA, they slow way down and you got to slow down to catch them. And so I think just that experience knowing that like that's what, how it works here is like, well, maybe that's how it'll work down here too. By sometimes, sometimes being ignorant to the tide is the best <laughs> way. <laughs> well, that's what I said to myself. I said, I'm not going to worry about the tide because I'm not going to figure it out in three days. So I'm just not even right. going to consider it. I'm just going to fish stuff that looks fishy. And if bass, they're there, yeah. they're there. Ba Bassmaster really affected a generation of tidal anglers because you listen to the Iconellis of the world and like doing these milk runs. I don't know a single competition that's been won in the past three years on the Potomac that was milk run. Everything is an area because the tide doesn't rip on the Potomac like it does in the Delaware system. Or right. like, even the James has more tidal, tidal pull. And the tide never listens. Like, And this is something that you know me and a lot of locals do. You get in there and it says like, the tide will start pulling at one and it's actually pulling at 1230. That was your bite window. You don't want to get too cute with timing it. And I think that's where that ignorance just, it does pay off because you're, you're going to hit the window at some point if you just stay in the area. But a lot of anglers just get antsy and they want to leave. And it's, it's such a stupid ass timing deal. You have to be at the juice when everything gets right or you're fishing blind. You know, I'll tell you right now for me, if my, my um, plan would have changed greatly if I wouldn't have seen that John boat tournament going out of our ramp. Um, mm. Once I hit that grass patch, if I wouldn't have gotten bit in the first 30 minutes to an hour on that grass patch, I would have been motoring my butt directly out to the mouth of Aquia and fishing the beach because at any point in time, you can catch 20 pounds out there. Yeah. It might suck condition wise, mm -hmm. But if you can weather it, if you can, you know, I, that's where I was. I was like, man, I, but I can't, I couldn't beat the John boats out there, you know, cause they had launched and, and you just watch them. Like you watch their lights and they're, they're just I'm like, oh, well, there goes that. I'm not going to go out there and fight, you know, with them because, but yeah, I mean the tide aspect I'll, I'll attest cause I can, I saw it happening. Like you saw the tide drop out shortly after we launched in the morning and it just started it just started pulling. Um, I don't think, I don't think the tide really affected my bite that much because I think the fish that I was fishing for in the morning were, were close to on beds, if not on beds already. But I think the tide always affects these fish some way. And I think when they're betting, what's <laughs> weird, Backing up, we had a weird ass tide because the water was just higher everywhere. Like uh, at Pohick, almost all the docks were flooded, which is really weird. And it didn't pull very hard, the current. So it pulled where you could noticeably see like the water moving was about seven o'clock, I think, which was like two hours ahead of when it was supposed to do. And it pulled for about 90 minutes and then you couldn't visually see it pull anymore. But then you could tell by the bank the water was still going down and that was because i think of the wind of out out main river was pushing and stacking it which can happen but my point is when you when we when you visually saw the water moving the bite was hot and i think everybody score tracker wise was lighting up but as soon as you visually stopped seeing that water moving it messed them up so i I guess I'm just saying the caveat to that is like, I think it affects them somehow, some way like bedding fish. I think they just get antsy depending on the water conditions you're dealing with and where their beds located. I think they're, I think they're working harder. Yeah. Right? They're working harder to keep, 
you know, everything that's moving past them off of their bed, whether that's, you know, mud getting thrown on their bed or whether that's bait that's getting pulled through their bed, they're working harder. So I think they get just a little bit dumber because they're like, oh, well, I'm just going to eat that because it's close. And you know what I mean? So I, I, I could be wrong. I don't have enough experience on the Potomac to really speak to it, but I think that that might probably have something to do with it. And we are also talking about the most unique, crazy circumstance, which is a betting fish, which does kind of throw out the laws of, of common sense and physics and stuff when it comes to this stuff. And you saw betting fish. Um, you know, I've had Billy Coles on, I've had Tyler from Lake Anna and they've all said like, this has been a weird ass year with the pre-spawn and the spawn and it's messed them up. And to see betting fish now, is pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> before I came down, I saw betting fish in a creek. On the on off the Susquehanna, so is it is it is it the solar eclipse thing? Is that what did this, or is it because it, it just went know. from cold to hot real quick? It didn't. No, I mean we out. had we had some warm days, man. We had some warm <laughs> days in in the creek. You know, some of the creeks that warmed up quicker than others. Like I saw fish doing bedding like things. I saw fish with you know red red tail marks, like they were they were doing what they're accustomed to do in mid April. Um, you know, are we a little late? Sure. Is the Potomac a little late? Maybe. I don't know. Compared to what you're used to, I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit late. Um, but I know that, you know, Nate said that he was fishing for bedding fish. I'm assuming he could see them. I saw bedding fish. There were fish that were bedding for sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, you saw what you saw and you caught what you caught. So, I mean, that's kind of the proof in the pudding there. So how did you stumble upon these, Nate? Was this something that you kind of like were hunting for or was it more of like a happy accident? No, it was more of a happy accident. Um, I was actually <laughs> coming back through an area that I'd fished in the morning when the, high, the tide was up. I couldn't see them. I didn't know they were there. And I was coming back through in the afternoon after the tide had dropped down and they were there. And I was, I saw them and I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to spend my afternoon doing. Um, caught my biggest fish of the day on Saturday doing that. And then I also caught another, I think it was like a two inch call doing that as well. Fishing for those fish on beds. So they definitely helped me out there in the afternoon after I found them. At what point did you think you had something going on? Pretty much right off the bat. Um, once I found that first inside grass bite, um, I felt like I could figure it out the rest of the day. Um, a lot of that's because of my experience. So we have a lake out here in Western PA. It's called Lake Primatunin. And they had a mic they had a microburst come through there. I don't even remember how long ago it was. It's been a it's been a while since it came through, but it basically knocked down almost every tree on the bank. And so the lake also grows in a big ring of hydrilla around pretty much the whole lake and so the lake sets up exactly how the area in the i was fishing with laydowns coming in shallow and then them ending at the grass and so once i kind of found that bite i was like okay i feel totally comfortable doing this i've done this a hundred times back home i know that you know, i know that they're going to change throughout the day but at least i can i know i can understand where they might be in the grass and so that kind of helped me figure out the pattern throughout the day why not a swim jig I just didn't throw it. I I don't really have a reason. I started off with a chatterbait and it worked and I just didn't pick up a swim jig. It was basically all that it was. <laughs> I had one tied on. I had planned on, you know, potentially throwing it, but once the chatterbait fight started, I just stuck with it. Listen, don't listen to Thomas. He loves he loves the swim jig. <laughs> he you know, you talk about a chatterbait or spinnerbait and he, and he's all well why not a why not a swim Dude, jig? A hundred percent. Um yeah, it's just fascinating to me because everyone throws the chatterbait and I've always had this weird, is it because it's so good or because everyone has now thrown it, it's a self-fulfilling cycle that if everyone throws it, it's good. It's almost like the Whopper Popper craze and it, clearly it works. You know, it, it does. I don't, I don't think it's any of that. I think humans, when, when, you, when, you, when you're able to see what you're doing and see the result when a fish eats it, it's the same thing as when you're able to feel what you're doing and you feel the result when a fish eats it. A swim jig is a surprise. Oh, yeah, it is, yeah. Right? Like, oh, God, let me just set the hook, right? A chatterbait is not a surprise. You're, why did it stop? I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe I got some crap. Oh, shit, it pulled back. Like, it's, there's, a, there's a feedback there with it. And I think humans, by nature, are more comfortable whenever they get that feedback versus a surprise. But People like, want feedback versus a surprise. I agree with that. But even like, I mean, you and I love crankbaits. Chris Gorsuch last time was like saying like, people don't like to throw crankbaits anymore. I was I like, is that, 
Is that because the chatterbait craze just pulled people away from crankbaits? No, I love crankbaits now even more because of the chatterbait craze. Like that a true crankbait fisherman is going to love a crankbait no matter what. But I, I've, I mean, my crankbait box is insane right now just because of everybody throwing a chatterbait because they get used to that one sound. They get used to that one profile. Ooh, and next yes. thing you know, my profile is going, you know, like it's, yep. it's the same thing, same thing with the swim bait game, you know, yeah. like <laughs> the mag draft. The mag draft is, is, is a huge player for me on the Susquehanna. Um, I didn't like to talk about it until Russ Snyder's blew it up last year at the Bassmaster and talked to him. Hey, I caught it. All 10 of my keepers on a mag draft six inch. And I'm like, no. Mm, do, you th- do you think <laughs> that'll you go away? That? Huh? Like, do you think that'll go away? Because and, and the, there's an argument to be made versus like lateral line feeders, like um, a large mouth versus visual feeders, like a small mouth. Like, will small mouth ever just be like, I'm done with the mag. I've seen that profile. Or is it something like they just can't get conditioned to? Our small mouth, our small mouth will definitely sight feed, but on the Susquehanna, our small mouth, they, they, they are a 100% good with lateral line feeding too. Um, those fish, I mean, you know, the mag draft, I honestly threw it down at the Potomac. I had a couple perch colored mag drafts that I was tossing around once I had my limit, hoping to luck into, you know, a couple big stupid ones and it just didn't pan out. Um, but I think the mag draft and, and similar type of swim baits, I think they just look natural. And, and I think it's a, it's almost a little bit of trickery. The chatterbait's not trickery. The tra- the chatterbait's pissing them off. The chatterbait's angering them. I think they hate the sound of it. I think they hate the vibration of it. Does it, can you make it look like a bait fish? Sure. But you know, there's going to be one I guy that's that. catching them with a, a uh, swim bait trailer and another guy's going to be catching them with a craw trailer. They don't really care about the profile. I think they're caring about what that blade is doing and why it's pissing them off. Um, but as far as, you know, the swim bait, I think that's a natural looking thing for them. I don't think it's going away. I think, I think it'll that, continue to get used. I think it's and- like the tube or the Cinco. Like that shit's never, it'll just always catch fish. Um, yeah, I mean, the, since the beginning of time where there's been some variation of a swim bait that we've been throwing, right? And they've just gotten more and more realistic because now people are taking bait fish and making molds of them. So, Nate, do you like to throw a trailer hook or, or have you ever thrown a trailer hook on a chatterbait or are you just going just straight with the... I, ooh, that was weird. I've looking. never I've never thrown a trailer hook. Actually, on, on <laughs> anything except for a buzzbait. Buzzbait's the only thing I've ever thrown a trailer hook on. Why? Because I don't fish moving baits all that much. Um, I spend most of my time flipping or frogging or punching. Most of the most of my summers are spent doing that, and then usually I'm fishing a river tournament if I'm not doing that, and that's a whole different ball game. But I punching still don't, in Pennsylvania. That is nuts. Yep. My God, that's crazy. That's all I do all summer. Ah, <laughs> uh, these places. I gotta figure out these places. That's really freaking cool that you can go punch there. So. You had by about one o'clock. How many inches do you think you had just to, to get us back on, on the so tournament? At one o'clock, I think that's about the time that I caught my big fish of the day, which was 19 and three quarters inches, which I think gave me around 87 <laughs> inches. I think that was before I caught. I think I caught my last call after that. It bumped me up to 88 and three quarters. So at that point, did you feel like you had it? No, not at all. I didn't feel like I had it when I hit 88 either. Um, and that's mainly because looking at past tournament results, because that's the information I had available to me. I'm um, looking at past events that MAKBF and other kayak groups have had. They've all taken 89 to 90 inches to win. And so I figured I had to get over 90 to feel like I had it in the bag. And so since I didn't hit that point, I didn't feel like I definitely had it. Yeah, I didn't think 90 was like, it's possible. The fish here are just stubby and fat, though. It's really hard. Bye. Like, it's just so hard to get that 90. Like, yeah, it, it's, yeah, somebody's going to hit 90, but it's right. not readily available, like, right. at other places, because our fish are weird. They really are. Yeah. And that's something I didn't know going into it. Yeah. All I could see was in past past years or whatever, it took, you know, eight, anywhere from 88 to 91 inches to win. And so I figured I need to get over that to at least be safe. Did you, did you, did you check the leaderboard at all throughout the day? 
I check it every time I submit a fit, every time I submit fish. Um, but I don't submit fish until I have a limit. So I'm one of the guys who I might not, you might not see me submit a fish until the last hour if it takes me that long to catch five. Um, cause my focus until I have a limit is to catch that limit. Um, but then after that, I usually check every time I submit a fish more so just to make sure it went through and calculated it properly. Not necessarily to look at whatever people have. I mean, obviously I glance and I can see that, but the main reason for looking is just to make sure that my fish went through and went through at the right length and my total matches up what I think it should be. When did you have that moment then? Was it, was it at, you know, the ceremony or was it on your drive there that you were like, holy shit. Uh, on my drive there, I knew I was yeah. at least at the top. Like I didn't necessarily know that I won it, but I knew that I had had a good enough day that I was probably in at least the top three, which was obviously a good feeling for a body of water in an area I've never fished before. Well, yeah. I mean, this is your first time there completely, but I mean, I mean, there you have it. I mean, you got 88 inches, you know, day, you know, the first day that makes it like, I'm assuming you're just basically not only just flying high with, with that wind, you must be fishing really relaxed in day two. Oh yeah. I'm probably too relaxed. I'll be honest. I do think that I fish a little bit too relaxed on day two. Um, I definitely missed a few fish that I definitely should have been able to put in the boat. Um, definitely made a few mistakes on some betting fish that cost me. I mean, it did, I ended up winning anyways, but it definitely fished too relaxed on Sunday. What's impressive is it was there for two days in a row because there was a really bad cold front. Like aqua it was fountain. different. It yeah. was different on day two. I did not catch them doing the same thing on day two. Well, let's were you get in. Keep us in suspense. What were you yeah. catching on day two? <laughs> yeah, so day two, I started off trying to do the same thing with the chatterbait. Didn't get bit at all on that inside grass line doing that, and so I actually immediately switched over to just a Texas rig Senko, um, mainly because I knew if there were fish there, I'd catch one on it. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's a bait that you'll catch something if it's there, you're going to catch it. Um, and so I started putting fish in the boat with that, and so I kind of ran with that. But I also noticed that the tide at high tide in the morning on Sunday was at least a foot and a half, if not two foot lower than it was the day before. Like there were lay downs that I had fish on day one that weren't in the water on day two. Yeah. And so I immediately knew that things are going to be different. And so I did that to start off. I kind of worked my way around that same area. I fished through that bedding area without, I couldn't see them in the morning. It wasn't light enough out yet. It was cloudy. Um, but I fished through it, um, didn't catch any there, but I knew that they were probably still there. And I kept going. And what I ended up finding was because the tide was already lower, the matted grass, the grass that was going to be matted was already matted. And between, so there's the bank, there was no grass, there was really, really thick grass. And then right after that, in this one area, it like sparsed out. And then it got really thick again after that. And I was like, well, that's interesting. I know that there, if I was in, if I was back home, I actually finished third in the tournament throwing a Senko fishing the exact kind of situation. And so I went with that. And that's actually ended up how I ended up being how I caught most of my fish on day two was in that crease between two thick areas of grass. And when you mean sparse, do you think it was because of like the depth change or something like that underneath the water? I have no idea. I couldn't tell you. I just, I used to tell that it was matted to my right, matted to my left, but right where I was. And there was a little shoot there where it wasn't matted. But How I, deep do you think I it was no just spitballing? Was it like a foot, six uh, feet? Probably two to four. Okay. Yeah. It, it sounds like a little deep. ditch there. Yeah. But. When did you try to do spawning fish or did you try to do spawning fish again? I did try to do spawning fish in the afternoon once that tide dropped out a little bit more um, and it got a little more light out. It stayed cloudy all day, but I knew that in the afternoon, I'd at least be able to see a little bit better. Um, I ended up going and I ended up being able to catch one off of a bed. It was 18 inches. Um, that ended up being, thankfully I caught that because that ended up pushing me in, in the first. Um, but when I, I noticed when I was out there day two was that the fish were not locked on like they were on day one. I don't know if it was because the tide was the water level was so much lower. Um, I do know that there was one big one that I wasn't able to get to bite on day one that I saw on day two. And she was actually sitting about two or three feet in front of her out away from her bed because her bed was in like six inches of water and she did not want to be up that shallow. So I don't mm -hmm. know if it was the water level. They got them all squirrely um, yeah. or if it was the clouds or the cold front, like could have been or could have been all of the above. I think it was together. all of them. That, yeah. that's um, a, lot. a lot of the a lot of the fish that were up there were just pacing back and forth. They weren't locked on. They weren't sitting there. They were just pacing back and forth. And if you threw anything in there, they just go hide in the grass. So the bed fishing was nowhere near as good on day two as it was on day one. But I was able to find one 18 incher that was locked on. So what you just described was what I encountered at the end of day one with those other bed fish. 
that you throw something on there and that fish would leave the bed and go directly into the grass and just stay there until whatever was on the bed would leave. Yeah. That is exactly what happened at the end of day one, whenever I was over there bed fishing. That's, that's crazy. And that's the hard place when you deal with, with creeks like a choir where it's when it gets super grass specific, the bite, because you can't switch to other things. I mean, like you go to Madawoman Piscataway way up North when that had grass, you had a ton of hard cover. So you can kind of almost like fish two different styles there. It's a lot. Hard. It's you can, but it is a lot harder when those conditions don't line up. Um, I'll, I'll tell you after listening to Nate, um, you know, I made a run day two and it really kind of affected. It, it's one of the reasons why I didn't catch a limit on day two. I, I left docks where I was catching fish. I left hardcover to go fish grass, to be with the cool kids and when I got down with the cool kids, I just hated it because like literally boats were zigzagging back and forth amongst each other. And I, I said to my buddy who was down there, I'm like, Hey man, there's like an hour left in the day. I'm like, dude, I've got to run North and try to fish these docks to catch two more fish. Cause uh, at the end of the day, I was sitting there with three fish and I'm like, this is terrible. Like I'm a terrible fisherman. I should just throw all my rods in the river and just. <laughs> Maybe keep the reels in the baits, but all my rods just getting tossed. But I was like, man, I got to go. I got to go check and see if I can find more fish. And as I was running up river, hitting docks, um, I ended up catching a short that I couldn't get the measure 12. And then on two docks later, I caught 16. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm so stupid. Like if I would have just left a little bit earlier to go back to what I was comfortable with, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that one, the water temperature was a lot cooler up there. And two, that cold front pushed them back to, I think it pushed them back to hard, hard cover. Um, yeah, at least I a hundred percent agree with you. And that's the thing is like, like having a hard cover bite in your back pocket is really, really good to, to have, but yeah, imagine, hard- imagine having it and leaving it. <laughs> But that's, that's, that, that's title is like, you're going to deal with like those kind of things and you just got to like ignore it. And that's really hard. But this is also why I think title fishermen suck when they get off of that and go to lakes. I mean, that's, there's a cliche about river rats because it's a very unique thing that you get built into where yet yeah, you just camp in areas. And if you go to Lake Norman or, or Hartwell or a lot of these places, you don't just camp on like three docks and expect to catch 25 pounds. You got to, usually you got to run. You don't do that on title, um, especially when the creek is. And that's the other thing, too, is like this is my hypothesis on this. I could be wrong. You could be in most lakes. You could be in a bad creek, but there's still five fish you could potentially win with. If you're not in the right creek on title, that's that's hot at the moment. You're screwed because you could be in Matta Woman and you can catch about 50 fish, that, that, but they're all two pounds. But then you go to a quiet and they're all four. Like that's just how it is. And I don't understand why, but that's what happens. But Nate, I mean, dude, this was absolutely insane. 88 inches day one, 87 inches day two, back to back wins. I mean, where the hell do you go from here? It's so weird when you hit a home run, your first at bat. Like I know where he goes. <laughs> I know where he goes. Where the, upper Chesapeake Bay. the upper Chesapeake Bay is also a grass fishery. And the Conowingo should have some grass as well. And it's part of the Susquehanna River. So I know where Nate should go. I know where I want Nate to go. I would love <laughs> to see Nate come back to us. Um, well, you Nate should look at the registration to see those and see if I'm on there or not. Because I am. Are you, oh, oh. I'm, I'm already signed up. <laughs> I'm already ready. <laughs> have you fished the bay before? Nope. Have you fished any of these tournaments on the schedule before? <laughs> Oh, the only no, actually, I haven't. I've ever the only one that I fished is, is Susquehanna, and it's the only one I'm not going to be at. So, all all the other tournaments are ones that are new for me. What? Yeah. What? yeah. Why? So, well, it's my daughter's first birthday that weekend. Okay, her, that's fair. Her very that's first fair. birthday She'll is on Saturday. More. I know, but that's Listen, not how we can <laughs> Nate, we can have a birthday party at my house <laughs> if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's just say this hypothetically: when that Susky tournament comes around and you're really doing well, with AOI, do you just throw her an extra birthday some other time? No, no, I, no. What I'll do instead? So I, get, <laughs> I, I also get married in October, the weekend <laughs> before the Native Watercraft event. So if I'm close, I'll go to that the weekend after my wedding. Ooh. 
timeout. Uh, so you the know, native event, the native not, event is not an AOI event. Gotcha. Um, RTOC happens before the native event. Well, then I'm just the first. I'm screwed. If I'm doing good. No, you're not. Listen, not buddy, then. listen, listen. <laughs> you're not. You're not screwed because the way the way our events are set up right now, you have you you have two underneath your belt right now. You have two wins. Right. If you come for the Conowingo and the Upper Bay, you have you now have four tournaments. There's the Juniata that you could come to June twenty second, and then honestly, the TOC. You only need I, th- I think you only need five events of ours to to win the TOC. So it's going to be your best four regular season events and your TOC finish. So All right, you're that might you're be okay. sitting you are sitting in a fantastic position, and if I can just. I know Nate is an incredibly humble person and the dealings that I've had with Nate, the places that I've met Nate, I think I met you out in Wisconsin one time, wasn't it? Or was it yeah. East West Harbor? Yeah. No, yeah, Wisconsin right? when, my car, when my car broke down and you had, you took me to your hotel to, to sleep for the night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, like, I know that this man is incredibly humble. He can go anywhere in this country and fish and, and catch them. Um, I would, I would caution every MAKBF angler, to pay very close attention with this dude having the lead that he currently has, people are going to really have to step their game up to catch this guy because he does not, he does not fail. When he does fail, it's like, Oh, I messed up a little bit. This, this guy can catch fish. So we're happy to have him. We're proud to have him. And uh, you know, he's going to show up at Conowingo in the upper Bay and see some things that are very similar to what he's used to. So that's Hopefully. a dangerous situation for any KBF <laughs> anglers. <laughs> Nate, thank you so much for coming on tonight. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on your big wins. And then Jake, of course, you've been on here a thousand times. Uh, thank you so much. Link in the episode description, everything we talked about, guys. If you would like to, you know, give it a thumbs up. It really helps me out in the algorithm. Also join our Patreon here as we strive towards to create our own nonprofit to help supplement the stocks of our local fisheries. Like and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.